if you will stand with us and let's sing our open our theme song for the week lift up the trumpet Please be seated. Once again, good morning. Oh, that was pretty good. Good morning. All right. Well, I just want to uh, let you know if you if you are enjoying the meals, if you're eating at the cafeteria on a regular basis, the next time you're there, just tell them a big thank you. Uh, how many in here would like to volunteer to cook for so many people? None of us would want that job, and sometimes a thankless job. So make sure that uh, those that are there, the students and the staff, uh, make sure that you let them know you appreciate all that they do uh, to make sure that we're all fed physically so we can enjoy the spiritual food as well. Also, if you notice in here, there are booths all the way around the, the gymnasium. And in any extra time you have, especially in the evening, make sure you stop by those booths and look at what the information is. I think that over here in the evening you can actually get massages. So that would be a very pleasant thing, wouldn't it? All right. Uh, would you please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians? We uh, had this as our verses we went through yesterday. We're going to read that kind of as a refresher and get, get us back into the mode of thinking for our speaker. Galatians, the fourth chapter, and we will read verses 1 through 7. Galatians 4, verses 1 through 7. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his, the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Elder Bandy, would you please come forward? We'll have a prayer of blessing on you and turn the time over to you 
for this morning. Would you please bow your heads? Uh, Father, thank you once again for this ongoing study, a study into your love and to the relationship that you want to have with each one of us. Lord, we again ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon Elder Bandy as he opens the word, and more than that, opens Jesus to us so that we will fall deeper in love with him because we know as we love him, we will be changed. And we pray this in his name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. your kind words. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Did you have a good night? The Lord was good to you? That's, that's good. <clears throat> so, here we are again. You know, I wanted to say, I just want to show you my book again, just in case you want to get the, uh, the whole scoop. There is a chapter in here on the two sanctuaries, the sanctuary of the Old Covenant, the sanctuary of the New Covenant, and the Apostles' uh, um, take on that. And we're not going to have time to look at that this, this week, so if you want to read that uh, chapter, you'll have to, have to go ahead and get, get the book. And uh, I don't think you'll be sorry you did. Uh, the Lord, I think, is blessed through this uh, study quite a bit. I've heard many people that feel that they have been blessed by uh, these subjects, and these are not new subjects. These are old subjects from uh, days gone by. And so uh, if, if you would uh, allow me, uh, would you bow your heads with me, and I will... Just say one more prayer for myself. Our Father, we come to your word. We come before you. We ask that your Holy Spirit will guide us, speak to our hearts. Lord, cause our hearts to burn within us as you open the scripture to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. I want to begin in chapter 3, where we kind of ended up yesterday, and this morning we're looking at the subject of slaves or sons. Now what we have begun to recognize from Paul's first discussion of the two covenants, he begins to explain, <laughs> not sure what that was, is this still working? Okay, good. He begins to explain the two covenants as <clears throat> two postures that we take before God. Uh, Hagar and Sarah represent the two postures. Hagar specifically represents what went on to a large degree at Mount Sinai and in Jerusalem of Paul's day. And I suppose we might even say... Uh, <clears throat> that this could be a factor or an element that pervades or is through our own church. We can each probably relate to a period in our Christian life when we were kind of legalistic and works-oriented and serving God out of a desire to be safe or saved rather than serving Him out of our love for Him and a desire to be like him because we find him so appealing and so attractive. And so Paul is giving us these two postures. Well, today we're looking at a new image where Paul talks about slaves or sons. And beginning in chapter 3, with the last few verses, um, in verse 26 is where I want to begin. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Faith is the way into the covenant. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The way to enter into sonship or daughterhood 
before God, to be a child of God, is faith. By faith we enter. The just shall live by faith. That's the righteous shall live by faith. And in Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> and I'll put this on the screen for you here, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You see, the two postures is bondage through fear. You remember Abraham took Hagar to himself because he and Sarah feared that they would not have a, 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 an heir. And you remember that mass of people at the foot of Mount Sinai, they feared and they stood afar back and they promised in the context of their fear to do all the things that the Lord had said. And Paul says, we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You see, we, we are adopted through faith into the family of God. And if we are Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. You know, what a heritage we have. Our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, these are our spiritual fathers. Fathers in the spirit. So then in Galatians chapter 4, Paul then begins to give an illustration of what he's trying to say. Chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Now, now get the picture here. Here you are, a child. You're born into a family, and the family has a large estate, and you stand to inherit the estate. You're going to be the heir of the estate. And you have servants and people working in the home. But as long as you're a child, you're no different than the, than the slaves and the stewards and the, and the people who work for dad. You're under guardians and, um, and stewards. You see, you have people telling you what to do. Even though you're the heir, you have people telling you what to do. You're no different than the rest of the, the slaves in the house. They tell you when to brush your teeth. They tell you when to go to bed. They tell you when to go to school. They tell you everything. And you're just working in that family like one of the slaves until the time appointed by the Father. Now there's a time appointed by the Father. So you're under all this until this time. You know, in Hebrews, Paul uses the same phrase because this is a theme of his theology. He's talking about the sanctuary services and the sacrifices and all these things. These are imposed upon you until the time of reformation. <clears throat> now when something is imposed on you, that means it's not in your heart to do. You're being told to do it. You're just like a slave. You're told what to do, where to go, when to be there. And it's imposed on you until the time of reformation. You see this time of reformation is the time appointed by the Father. And the time of reformation happens when you finally come to faith and, and you're transformed. You have the new birth experience and, and your heart is drawn out to God. This is the time of reformation. And, and when that happens, you're no longer under the stewards and the, those who are telling you what to do because now the righteousness that the law is requiring is now in your heart, and you're living it out as if it's your own idea. Nobody has to tell you when to brush your teeth. Nobody has to tell you where to be and what to do, because through your walk with the Spirit, through faith, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you, and you're doing what you want to do anyway. 
in your own heart. You know, it's kind of like I remember one time driving out through Nevada. And you know, this is back when the speed limit restrictions were just pretty stringent. And uh, you know, some of those roads, I don't know if you've been out in Nevada, but you get on the road and it's as far as you can see straight. And you know what the speed limit is. 55. Oh man, it's just not in my heart. <laughs> and so pretty soon you rationalize and you're going along and you look down, you're doing 70, 75, 80, just cruise along. And pretty soon you look up there, there's a little white sign on the side of the road. It's way up there, you can't read it, but you know what it is. The closer you get, 55 miles per hour. So you slow down. See. It's not in your heart. You have to be told. The sign has to tell you. You see? But when the time of Reformation comes, ha, you just drive the speed limit you know that you should be driving. It's in your heart. I, I pastored a church in a community recently, a um, few years ago, it, I drove this street every day and it went right by a school. And I was always surprised because there was no sign there that said school speed limit, 20 miles an hour. There was nothing. There was no sign in front of this school. And I thought, yeah, we, we shouldn't need a sign, should we? We should know that when you go by a school, it should be in your heart that when I go by a school, I'm going to slow down because of the kiddos. You see? I'm going to take care. I'm going to drive safely because it's in my heart. Not because there's some sign telling me I have to do it. We're not in bondage anymore to fear. We're, we're living this righteousness by faith, this life of faith, you see. So in Galatians chapter 4, verse 3, even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. The elements of the world are like the rules of the world. The speed limit signs. You don't kill. Don't kill your neighbor. You don't steal things. You see, and, and when we're children, we have to be told this. But when the fullness of the time had come, Verse 4, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, we don't have time this morning, but to be under the law means to be under its condemnation. It doesn't necessarily mean to be under its jurisdiction. It means to be under its condemnation. Jesus was born, as soon as he was born, the law was looking at him and was coming for him. Because our sins were there on him. And he was seen as a transgressor by the law. And, and he was under the law, under the condemnation of the law. Not because of his own sins, but because of our sins. My sins. So he was born under the law, verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law. That we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. <clears throat> and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Can you say amen to that? This is our standing. We are heirs. We are sons and daughters of God. See, you know, Jesus reflected this concept, this image of distinction between slaves and sons in John 15, verse 15, when he said these words, I'll put them on the screen for you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Now you see, we're no longer called servants. 
Even though someone brought up to me that Paul said we should be servants of God, but if you read on another verse or two, he talks about being servants from the heart. There's a distinction there. So Jesus says, I don't call you servants, but I call you friends because everything I have, my Father has told me I have given to you. You know, in those days of Jesus, in the ancient days, if the Father had a business he would uh, share with his son the trade secrets. And he wouldn't share those trade secrets with the servants because the servant might go out and start his own business. So the father would have his trade secrets of his business, <clears throat> but the, the son, when the time came and he could trust the son, he would share those trade secrets with his son so that his son could carry on the business. And so Jesus is saying, <clears throat> I'm not calling you servants anymore, but I'm calling you friends for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You've got the inside scoop. I, I through my spirit, am giving you what the very heart of the Father is. And, and you see, we have, we have the inside scoop. We know what it means to walk with Jesus, to follow Jesus. We know the character of Christ and we are embracing it and we're following it because we have the inside story. The, the servants, the slaves, they don't know any of that. All they know is the rules of what they're supposed to do each day in their job, you see. And, and so, you know, as I thought about this, I thought of an illustration <clears throat> it's kind of like it's kind of like a playpen, these rules. It's like a playpen. And when I'm a child, I, I'm put in the playpen, and what do I do? I stand there and I grab a hold of the sides and you know I jerk on them. I, I want out of the playpen. But no, the playpen is there for a purpose to keep me safe. I might be in the playpen out in the front lawn, you know, and, and God that my father might be saying, now don't be going out in the street, but he knows that I'm too young and I don't understand the dangers of the street. So he sticks me in the playpen and I can't, I just want to get out. But when the time comes and I'm smart enough and I understand what's going on, I can get out of the playpen and of my own free will and my own free volition, I can decide to stay out of the street because I see the dangers there. And this is how God wants us to walk with him and serve with him. He doesn't want us just relating to him like we're just slaves or servants and we're just saying, give us the rules and we'll do what we're told. No, he's saying, I want to give you my heart. I want my heart to be in your heart. I want you to know what I know. I want you to live your life the way I would live my life if I were on the earth because that's the only way you and I can really be in relationship. I don't want you to be a slave. I want you to be my son, my daughter, who knows me and has embraced my value. You know, I thought about this, and good slaves, they talk a lot about the requirements, you know, the rules and the restrictions. The slaves aren't into really examining the motives or checking out what the motives are for things. They, they just want to know what the rules are. They're really focused on punishment or reward. You know, I remember when my kids were little, we always had a little, each Friday, we would draw um, little poker chips. I'm sorry, that's what we used, poker chips. And we had written on the poker chips all the little chores that needed to be done in the house. And we had them in a can, and we shake them up, and all of us, including mom and dad, we would pull out a poker chip to which chore we had to do that day. So we all worked doing our chores. And I remember my little daughter. She would be watching my son. And she'd say, Dad, Jack is not cleaning the toilet. You know, that's how slaves are. They're really fixated on, on, on the behavior 
you know. And, and they really get judgmental when other people aren't keeping the rules. Oh, look at that. They're not doing this right. They're, they're eating this or they're doing that. This is the way slaves are. This is the way they talk. They're very judgmental and they're fo focused on behavior and they're really eager to make sure that everybody else is behaving the way that they know they should be behaving. But there's no sense of, of what's going on inside. And, and I said to my daughter, you know, I know that. I know he's not. I'm watching. But you know, I, I, in my own heart, I, I wanted to think of a way that I could help my son come to a place where he would clean the house because he saw it was a good thing to do. Not because dad had ordered him to do it, you see. I don't want that kind of relationship with my kids. And, and God doesn't want that kind of relationship with us either. He wants us to see the value in doing the things that he has asked us to do, as if they were our own ideas. And, and we can even say to the Lord, you know, Lord, if you never asked me again, and I, I would still be doing these things. Because it's in my heart to do it. You see, friends, this is righteousness by faith. And, and God wants to make this happen for us. Now, there are some slaves that are rebels. You know, I'm telling you, slavery is a burden. And, and having come from outside the church, I have recognized that there has been a lot of slave talk and a lot of slavery that, that goes on among us as a people. Because we're, we're real fixated and focused on law. And so it's real tempting and easy for us to, to, to feel like our job is to give orders and bark out commands and make sure people are doing what they ought to be doing. And if they come in the back door of the church and they're wearing things, that they're not supposed to be wearing, we point it out. Because we're fixated on, on, the, on the rules. And we're not fixated on winning hearts. See. And so children who grow up under this constant bombardment of rules and regulations, and, and they feel so hemmed in, and, and then they look at their parents and they see the contradictions in their parents, and, and pretty soon, they decide they're going to run away. They're going to leave because they're tired of slavery. And so you have runaway slaves and you have slaves that stay in the house. See? And, and really, the runaway slaves and the slaves that stay in the house, they're in the same legalistic boat. The slaves that stay in the house, they're fixated on the rules and how they want to keep all the rules and they want to get everybody else to keep the rules. And the runaway slaves, their mentality is looking for ways to get around the rules. And so they leave the church or they leave the family and they decide they're just going to throw themselves into breaking the rules because they're so tired of slavery. And, you know, I'm telling you, Adventists who have grown up in the church and they leave and they go outside, they have a real tough time because they really don't know how it works out there. You know, but, but, but they're in this legalistic rebellion against the rules. And then you have the sons and the daughters. They follow God because they themselves know that it's right. Because in their own hearts, the Holy Spirit has brought the principles of God's righteousness, which is in harmony with all those rules we know about. It brings those principles of, of the righteousness of Christ into the heart, and now it's my own idea to keep the Sabbath. I don't have to be told to keep the Sabbath. I want to keep the Sabbath. I see the value in keeping the Sabbath. I see the value of the 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 things that the Lord has asked us to do, maybe in the way that he would like for us to take care of our bodies and the way we should eat. I, I see value in that for myself, whether or not God ever asks me again. I see the value in that, and I'm doing it because my own heart is telling me to do it. 
Because my own heart is wedded to and connected with the heart of God. And I now think like he does. And I'm one with him, you see. I like this statement here from the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. In heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening of something to something unthought of. I mean, think about that. Think about those words for a minute. In heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. In fact, when rebellion happened, it came to the angels as something unthought of that there was a law. Law? We don't, we don't serve God out of law. You know, he's not, our, he's not like a big master, you know, that just tells us what to do. We serve out of love. She says, look at this. In their ministry, the angels are not as servants, but as sons. There is perfect unity between them and their creator. Obedience is to them no drudgery. Love for God makes their service a joy. You know what? It should be a joy to us to serve God and to do the things that we discover. You know, I remember back when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist. Man, I'm telling you, my life turned upside down and spun around and headed the other direction because I was finding things in the Scripture and in the spirit of prophecy, and these things were like life-changing to me. They were amazing, and I just absorbed them. I just accepted them because the Holy Spirit was working with me, and he put them in my heart, and I wanted to do these things. You know, my brother, he became a Seventh-day Adventist about a year before I did, and he was the one who came after me. He just dogged my trail, and books and pamphlets and telling me things, and I'm just, oh, what's what's happened to this guy? You know, And, and pretty soon he gave me the great controversy. He said, you need to read this book. And at this point, I'm a Catholic. And so I read the book, and wow. I had no clue there could be so much knowledge and truth to be, to be known. And my life changed. I started embracing things. You know, I grew up, my brother and I grew up on a cattle ranch, and here we are working in the cattle business with my dad, and all of a sudden, we're becoming vegetarian. Oh, I mean, only the Holy Spirit can do this. You see, and so our lives changed, and my dad looked at us and just thought, oh, what's happened to my boys? But he was good about it. He loved us. My dad was, he was a good man. We loved him, and he loved us. But my obedience and our obedience, it's not drudgery. We can't wait to find out more how we can be like Jesus, what we can do and how we can change. It's not drudgery. You know, I shared with you the illustration yesterday of my children, you know, when they were young. You know how it is. You tell them they have to brush their teeth. Is it drudgery? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, they don't want to brush their teeth. They sneak around. They try to skip it and, you know, everything. They don't want to brush their teeth. Hopefully, someday, they will grow up and see the value in brushing. And they will, de- they will tell themselves, I need to brush my teeth. And if, if our kids are like 35 years old and we're having to call them up every day and say, have you brushed your teeth yet today? You know, you brush your teeth. You see, they're not, we don't want them to be slaves. We want them to be sons. We want to, them to embrace the values that we hold dear so that it, we can back off and we can let them go. And they're free. It's freedom. Freedom from the drudgery and the slavery of all of that. Galatians 4, beginning in verse 8. But then indeed when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. 
Oh, that's how it is, isn't it? Before we come to know God, we, we serve something. We serve our idols. I remember Johnny Cash, you know? He, he was the one. I knew every Johnny Cash song. I could sing them all, play the guitar. We could sing them, my brother and I, my dad. We knew them all. Before you know God, you serve these things that are really not God's. And it can be even religious things. Slaves can worship their religion. You see, they can get all caught up in, and, and their identity is their religious behavior. And Paul says, before we know, knew God, we served those things which by nature are not God's. But now, after you have known God, or, or, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. You see, he's saying, why do you want to go back to this bondage of rules without the spirit, without faith? You see... You know, it's interesting here, he says, but now after you have known God, or rather are known by God. You know, we often talk about how important it is to know God, who to know is life eternal. Show me now thy way that I might know thee, Moses said. But we don't talk very often about how important it is that God know us. You know, when you're a parent, when you're first, parent, first a parent, that little baby comes along, and I, I don't understand it. Everybody does this. You know, to, I'm sorry, but to me, all little babies look the same. They have this little round face and a cute little smile and little bright eyes and little ears. They all look the same, but you know what? Not to mommy and daddy. They look at that little thing, and they say, ah, I see myself. I know this is my baby. Look at those ears. Or look at that little nose. Oh, that's your nose, Daddy. You know? And, and there's nothing more exciting for a parent than to see himself in his children and say, I know this, this child. This child is mine because I see myself in him. And that's what it means to be known by God. I know my sheep. You see? I know my children because I see myself in them. I see the spirit in them. I, I see my character in them. In John chapter 10 and verse 14, I'll put it on the screen for you. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. This is the end of the, the thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. I'm sorry. I get carried away and get way ahead of myself. She says, so in every soul wherein Christ, the hope of glory, dwells, his words are re-echoed. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. You see, that's, that's what God is looking for in us, that we delight to do his will, because that's how he is. It's how Jesus was. And so in John chapter 10, and verse 14, and verse 27, are these words. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. They know me. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You know, he knows his sheep. He looks at us and he says, I see myself in that person. And he smiles. He says, these are my these are my children. Look at them. They're, they're all like me. They take after me. But the slaves, you see, they don't take after Jesus. Jesus was never a slave, you know, with that somber, stern look on the face, looking around, looking for people, breaking the rules and all that. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus was never that way. Jesus was a person who loved righteousness, and he loved people. And he gave his love to people who were the most outcast of society. 
And when he looks down and he sees us doing the same thing, he says, these are my children. These are my, these are my sheep. I see myself in them. I know my sheep. They know me. It's a, it's a, it's a pact we have. It's a thing we have going. Matthew 25 and verse 11 and 12. You remember this text. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. I don't see myself in you. Oh, yeah, you're a religious person. You do all these religious acts and duties and you go to church on Sabbath, and you do this, and you do that, but I don't know you. I don't, I don't see myself in you. I don't see my spirit in you. I don't, I don't see my love for others in you. I, I see lots of judgment and criticism and gossip and things like that in you, but that, none of that's me. You know, That's not my, my characteristics. I don't recognize you. And again, in Matthew 7, verse 22 and 23, Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. See, and these are people who are really focused on law-keeping. They're really focused on the legal aspect. Service to them is, is a legal thing. We do this and this and this because the master has ordered us to do them. Sure, I wish I could not have to do them. It's not really in my heart to do them, but I'm doing them just because I want to be safe. In fact, all that the Lord has said, we will do. We, we just want to be safe. We just want to be saved. And, Jesus, and they go through all emotions, and then Jesus says to them, I don't even know you. That is going to be one of the most horrifying disappointments the universe has ever seen. It's people who have lived their whole life trying to be religious, trying to do things, just doing it through a spirit of legality. They're slaves and coming up to the gates of heaven and being turned away. Because they never connected with Jesus by faith. Friends, if you have not connected with Jesus through faith, don't eat, don't sleep, don't do anything until you get on your knees and come to Christ and, and make sure you wrestle with him like Jacob and say, I will not let you go until you bless me. We need this blessing of righteousness that comes through faith. Behold, spend that thoughtful hour a day beholding the Lamb of God, beholding the life of Jesus, especially the closing scene, until your heart is broken, until you see what sinner you really are, even though you might have been religious all your life, to, when you see what a sinner that you have really been and how righteous Jesus is, and then Throw yourself in his direction. Cast yourself at his feet. And lay hold of him. And say, I will not let you go until you bless me. You see, that's the thing we need to do. And while it's important that we know God, it's important that God knows us. And when we're in that posture, he knows us. Oh, we may make mistakes. We may misunderstand things. We may not know everything. And we may trip and fall now and then, but we are his sheep. And he knows that. Because we get up and we keep moving up the mountain. We keep moving towards him. We keep moving towards the glory. We don't give up. In John chapter 8, Verse 35, Jesus said, And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. 
You know, slaves may be in the house right now. But those that are, of us that are sons and daughters, we need to help them. We need to love them. We need to lift up Jesus to them. We need to allow Jesus' righteousness to be seen in our life so that those who, are, who don't know him yet as their Savior, whether they be in the church or out of the church, so that they have a, an opportunity to know him that they may see Jesus in us because the sad thing is that the slave does not remain in the house forever. Only for a time, but the son will remain forever. Come back tomorrow and we will continue to carry on this uh, little journey through the covenants, through the two postures and... Uh, I wish I had time about, about eight days here with you to cover everything I'd like to cover. But uh, tomorrow, let's see, what is it we'll be looking at tomorrow? Um, it's going to be um, the glory that excels. The glory that excels. So come tomorrow and we'll, we'll be blessed by God again. Brother, would you come and pray for us? Would you please bow your heads? Father, thank you again uh, for revealing more of yourself to us. Lord, what a privilege to be your sons and your daughters, to know that you are our Father, and that as a loving Father, you still give us such good gifts. The greatest gift, of course, is the gift of Jesus Christ. Lord, um, we open our hearts again to you now and invite him in in a deeper way than ever before because we want to be like him and we know that's the way that happens. And go with us now as we leave this meeting for the rest of this day. May we bask in your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.